it's very important for a damage restoration contractor to find the service titan like company built for their space and that's kind of like a new trend going on investors are investing in which is b2b vertical SaaS within niches it's interesting that the technology space there's there's a lot of players emerging in the tech space it's truthfully hard to know which one's the right fit for the business these days because there's so many out there so but it sounds like that niche i think that the principles of restoration millionaire apply to anybody as a whole i think they're well applied to a broad audience of let's call them entrepreneurs as a whole trying to build impact within the world Alex, welcome to the Sightshade Podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Matt. How are you, yeah, man? Well. Or, or should I say mate? <laughs> Whatever. We'll, we'll, I'll respond to anything. Hey, you. Oi, mate. <laughs> um, tuning in all the way from Chicago, Illinois. Welcome. I've never been there, but I hope to one day. I'd love to get to Wrigley Stadium. Yeah, I heard you're a big uh, baseball fan. Yeah. Cubs or White Sox? Which one did you root for? Neither. I'm a sadly a Toronto Blue Jay no. fan, and they suck right now, so... Oh, I see. Yeah, we're not going to talk about that. Got it. But anyway. Makes sense. But we're not here to talk about baseball. Nice. We're here to talk about, well, actually, I, mean, I guess we're here to talk today a little bit about how we can unlock some of the obstacles that a lot of trade businesses and in, in the renovation and restoration space might run into when they're trying to grow a business. And I've got a bit of insight into this as well, because we, you know, as a marketing agency, we've kind of, we, we do a fair bit of this on the on the lead gen side, helping businesses sort of forecast their growth patterns, but it would be good to sort of put our heads together and um see what we come up with here um but before we do just let's jump in a little bit to i suppose your background where you're from what you do how you got there yeah absolutely yes i'm a young entrepreneur based out of chicagoland uh fun fact about me i'm actually a first generation uh immigrant from romania so my parents were born in communist romania dad grew up with no running water um came to the united states of america for the american dream uh with baby me took my first steps actually on american soil literally, which is kind of a cool American story, I guess. Um, and yeah, grew up in the Chicagoland area, um, was an entrepreneur my whole life, only had one job at a high school, right, right while I was in high school, I was doing uh, cleaning cars at a car wash when I was 15. And then after that, did all kinds of weird stuff, uh, built websites and, you know, did some of the agency stuff that you're talking about while in high school, was a DJ, did some wedding videography, sold a bunch of knickknacks, and uh one day my dad and i were kind of sitting on a beach in uh florida talking about hey what's the next big thing and we decided to start a restoration company long story short my dad had all this experience in subcontracting for restoration companies and he was afraid of going on his own because he didn't know how to sell i was super young straight out of high school felt like i could sell anything to anyone so i'm like hey how hard could it be so we basically partnered together started a damage restoration company in the Chicago land market, uh, grew that to 90 or so employees, um, eight figures of, of annual revenue, Chicago land leader in damage restoration. And um, yeah, started it from one truck and some equipment. And um, fast forward while growing that company, I realized that tech within the space is very um, archaic as it is in most trades. Mm. So, you know, we had this, what if, what if we could build a, a software solution to solve that problem? And that started Albiware, which is a uh, venture-backed software company um, that services the damage restoration space. And then while building Albiware and falling in love with reading books, I realized that there were no business self-help books for the restoration space. So I decided to write Restoration Millionaire, which became a best-selling uh, book within the restoration space. And that's kind of fast forward oh. a two-minute uh, real quick flash on on my, my history. Yeah. So, Chronic over overachiever is what you're saying. Mm, I think self inflicted pain problem solver. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but sure, whichever one you'd like to pick. Um, there's definitely way more overachievers out there than than me. So, sure. um, yeah, it's interesting that the technology space. There's um, there's a lot of players emerging in the tech space. It's truthfully hard to know which one's the right fit for you know for the business these days because there's so many out there. So. But it sounds like that niche, you're probably right. There's probably very little within that micro niche, you know, which is good to hear. Um, you see a lot of the guys going for the big yep. ones, you know, the 
um, which which are amazing, by the way, like the service titans and all these kind of things. But then they don't always necessarily correlate to every type of business. So yeah, it's good to see. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, we actually went to to service titan um, at first because we we thought that their feature set was appealing. But the reality is, you know, you can't ever find one product that fits multiple industries right. because of the intricacies of the industries. Yeah. And that's where I like my suggestion for anybody even listening to this podcast is really look at the person who's building within your space because different spaces have different things. So like damage restoration has the insurance component, yeah. which a plumber doesn't have, for example. Um, so it's very important for a damage restoration contractor to find the service type and like company built for their space. And that's kind of like a new trend going on that investors are investing in, which is B2B vertical SaaS within niches. Yeah. But yeah, well, I know for sure there's a lot of listeners out there that are in that space. Um, and you were saying offline before that you you guys are ac- active pretty much globally now, right? You've got clients over here in Australia or North America, pretty much everywhere. So if you guys out there are in the in the damage restoration space, we do insurance work or whatever, and you can, I'll, I'll post some links to um, Albiware uh, in the show notes for you guys to go check it out. Uh, cool. All right. That'd be great. Well, let's jump in. So I guess um, like the, the key focus, I suppose, for this podcast is um, – business businesses that are in the insurance space or you know remedial building damage restoration that kind of thing um the is the are we going to be focusing this topic or this today's podcast directed at them or is it going to be a little bit more general as to how how we, they can actually grow a business based on you know what you've what you've learned in the past no i mean i think that that the principles of of restoration billionaire apply to anybody as a whole i would say You know, there's the nucleus of damage restoration where they're like super specific, you know, man, this speaks my language. But then I think if you go to home service as a whole, there's a lot of tangential things. And then you could even take it a layer out even broader um, as just business lessons and entrepreneurs at the end of the day deal with the same struggles and the same problems. So I think for the sake of this podcast, we should zoom out. And um, I think we could talk about the learnings in the book. And obviously they stemmed from restoration. Um, but I think they're well applied to, to a broad audience of let's call them entrepreneurs as a whole, trying to, you know, build impact within the world and, uh, feed their families as well. Yeah, no, it would so. be good to be good to unpack some of the, uh, I mean, I, I haven't read the book, but, um, I'll, I'll, I'll get it off the podcast, but it'd be good to unpack some of the, um, parts of that book, because I think anything that's sort of been published and the guys are you know if, it, if it's a bestseller then there must be some good stuff in there right so let's just jump into that so where do you want to start yeah yeah i mean i think you know the whole concept uh well i mean there's two concepts that we should probably talk about one is the concept of the restoration millionaire method which i think i'll unpack and distill in in a broader sense of of the whole audience and then the second one is actually a quote that came from the restoration millionaire method that immediately once that solidified, I went and bought the domain and said, it's going to be the title of my next book, (laughs) which is the concept that hustlers fail at scale. And the way it just came out, like when I was writing it, hustlers fail at scale. I'm like, Ooh. And then I went on domain.com and found hustlers fail at (laughs) scale.com. And that was available. I'm like, okay, done vision board. That's going to be the wall street journal bestseller. Um, I'm, um, you know, saying this out loud right now. But yeah, I think if, if we dive into those two topics, it, it might be worth our time um, and then, you know, kind of go from there. What do you yeah, think? Let's do it. So I guess the the concept of the restoration millionaire method, um, I really wanted to learn from everything we had done growing a company, you know, I call it by accident, right? Like my dad and I wanted to uh, do a million, uh, $2 million a year of work and walk away with $100,000 a year each individually. And that was what we had set out to do at the beginning. So there was no crazy, Hey, let's scale this, knock it out of the park, you know, 90 or so employees and and so on and so forth. And then we ended up growing and that whole growth journey was very painful. Like, you know, a lot of problems, a lot of things that we didn't know about. And then I, when I wrote the book, I wanted to like distill my knowledge and my learnings into something similar into a playbook. And that's where the restoration millionaire method kind of came out. And the restoration millionaire method for damage restoration contractors basically said, hey, look, here's the guide on how to get from zero to 10 million, I zero to eight figures of restoration work, but let's call it for our audience of X work, HVAC, plumbing, whatever. And it kind of told users to follow this progression of going from fishing hole to fishing hole, what I call them. So you're fishing in different holes. Um, 
and strategically focusing on one fishing hole at a time. And your first fishing hole needs to be the one that requires the least amount of your effort and has the most leverage. So in, in the restoration millionaire method to get to your first million dollars of revenue, you're actually focusing on online market. And that's the first hole and you're focusing on one service offering. So the key is to actually start with the first fishing hole, which is online marketing. And the reason you focus on that fishing hole and, and the other parts of the fishing hole is one service offering. And the key is you want to focus in the area where you can spend the most time trying to figure out the production side of your business and worry the least amount on sales and marketing. And that's where I found the beauty within the restoration millionaire method being, being done is, you know, you can go find a really good agency that can run ads, run SEO and such that could start making the phone ring. It won't last forever. Like it'll only get you up to a certain level, right? And then you start experiencing diminishing returns, but you're basically buying back your time. So you don't have to worry about building relationships or selling in any other shape or form during that time. And you could focus on just getting your value prop, your operational value prop really well, which means show up to the customer's house, do things very, you know, exceptionally well, hone in the system from start to finish, right? And then the other key is in restoration and just like a lot of other businesses, there's multiple types of service offerings that one business could have. You focus in on just the one service offering that has the most gross margin specifically. Why? Because you could always add more service offering later, but you want to have the most juice to squeeze at the beginning, you know, and typically the ones that have the highest gross margin are also the ones that are the most forgiving, right? You can make mistakes and have enough gross margin to focus on. Um, and that is the first fishing hole to get to the first million. And it's kind of the opposite of what most business owners do. Most business owners, they try to, you know, go to all the networking groups. They go to try to build all the relationships. They also try to, you know, spend money in all these different channels, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, hire the different agencies, put the billboards on, and then also do five different service offerings because they think like that's how you're going to be able to scale your business. When in fact, then you kind of become jack of all trades, master of none. And then after, you know, the first fishing hole, then you move on to the next fishing hole, which typically is keep the same offering. So in our situation was emergency services, but then go expand out to a couple more channels, to one more channel specifically, actually. Right. Channel, so then. So what do you, when you say channel, you, do you mean like a different marketing channel? Well, so you can, you can interpret this a few different ways. You can think about it as, as marketing channel. You could also think about it as, you know, sales channel. So online paid ads could be a bucket. So then you go and you say, hey, I'm going to go build relationships with referral partners. Right. Okay, well, who are potential referral partners? So if you're a plumber, maybe a property management company could be a referral partner, right? Okay, great. I'm going to now start building relationships with property management companies, just property management companies, not insurance agents and, you know, realtors and whatever, just this, right? So it's my online marketing is going and let's call that paid ads. I don't think you need to be as specific as to, it depends on your business, right? But which specific advertising channel it is, let's group it all into paid ads, right? And then add in property managers, right? And still keep your core service offering. Don't go away from your core service offering. You want to keep that in as a base, right? And that's how you get to your whatever, one to $3 million, call it. Then after you've done that, you take your learnings from your first two fishing holes, call it online marketing and property managers, and you try to systematize, okay, well, what worked with property managers? And chances are you'll find out that, hey, they had some sort of value prop and some sort of pain point that they referred you out, and you had some sort of playbook on how you went after the property managers, and then you start going after multiple types of referral sources and your online marketing while still maintaining the core focus. And then the next fishing hole is basically now that you've got all these different referral sources referring one service, now is the time to think about additional bolt-on services. And then at the last point, once you've reached diminishing returns within, you know, the one service, all the channels within one market, you might think, okay, let me start expanding my territory by adding another location or growing, you know, the market size bigger and such. But the key is you're constantly focusing on one. That's rule number one of the restoration millionaire method, because if you don't focus on one, you'll kind of get distracted and go all over the place, which is typically what entrepreneurs do. And then the second thing is focusing on that one service offering, right? Um, so yeah, I don't know how this relates to kind of what, what you teach and what your ideology is. I'd love to hear your take on it, but 
that's just yeah. my quote unquote well, secret it's, sauce. It's pretty similar in truth. Like when, when, when people come to work with us, they're, they're very often quite all over the place. Like they might be, you know, builders that have kitchens, bathrooms and decks and pergolas and first, second story additions and all this kind of stuff. And so we do actually channel all of that initially into one. We'd say, oh, what's the core one that we can work on here? What's got a good ROI? What's got a good turnaround time, good cash flow? We do kind of focus on that one, which is normally often the smaller projects for them because we can kind of, mm-hmm. they're, 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 the turnaround on those is, is a little bit quicker, you know, a lot quicker actually. Um, and then, yeah, the, the, and, and the marketing angle is an interesting one like, because most of the case, most of the time when businesses come to us, they're fundamentally, um, dependent on referrals and word of mouth. And you just, well, I've just never seen anyone scale that. And so mm-hmm. when they're coming to us, they're looking for a way that they can forecast their growth and their trajectory. And we can do that with our model quite well, but i adamantly have said over and over again and I would never ever um, tell anyone to you know keep all their eggs in one basket you know the, the worst scenario is when people come to us and we're like their Hail Mary it's like this is the last hope if this doesn't work we're done kind of thing and I'm like oh, I'd, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to know about it you know it's like I think mm. it's interesting like I think when people they've got a, that like you see it all the time like you know one of my one of my colleagues and friends here he's got a huge home service business in Australia um, like shooting towards 100 million sort of, you know, uh, revenue. And they're, you know, they, they still invest heavily into fridge magnets and newspaper ads. And mm-hmm. it, most people would look at that and laugh, but he's like, well, it, it works for us. Like we have a huge, we, we get like 20% of our revenue from, why wouldn't we do it? And I'm like, yeah, yep. that's right. Why wouldn't you do it? But I think so sometimes people yeah, yeah. have this polarizing perspective of what's right and what's wrong when in the reality can be different. And I think they, you really need to, it doesn't have to be one or the other. It just has to be like everything working in collaboration and unison to form like a little ecosystem there, which is really what moves the needle. Hundred percent. But one you mentioned something about, like sorry, you yeah. oh, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Oh, so you you mentioned word of mouth not being scalable. Um, tell me more. Like why why isn't word of mouth scalable? Well, I guess it, it is to a point, but I've never. I mean, there's a, there's a the reality is like one month they'll get 20 referrals and the next month they'll get none. And then the next month they'll get none, and the next month they'll get none. And so it's, it's scalable in the sense that you can continue to build relationships and, and mm-hmm. things like that for sure. But it's very, it's not as predictable as when you can say, put money into a, a, a traffic source, which you know is converting at a certain rate. And it just becomes a numbers game. hundred percent. Like, well, you put this much yep. in, you get this much out, and you need this many of them to make this much. Like, it's kind of a – you can yep. kind of reverse engineer it. So, <clears throat> but, yeah, you, you're right. You, you definitely can build – the reality is the time constraint, and this is, I suppose, what you were kind of touching on before, like the, the time that you need to invest into the networking side of things. Like, we, we have businesses out here that, that, that do that, the, like business networking yep. events and things like that. And yep, you're, yep, going yep. Up, you're going to show up once a week and you're going to be there for three hours on a, you know, and you're going to do all these networking events and you got to go meet all these different people. And you like, it's like, it's a full on commitment, you know, and it works really well for some businesses. Like it really, it really does. But eventually they'll get to the point where that will tap out even within the yeah. networks. Like it just taps out. And so I have the same opinion of those networks, but we actually, we scaled up based on referral based marketing, but not in the sense of word of mouth from anybody accidentally. If you can find the right channel partner or the right person that's always there. So in our case, we went and marketed to plumbers because plumbers would always find oopsies because who, who does the homeowner call? the plumber when there's an oopsie and then, you know, would show up and then we incentivize the plumbers paid them to refer us work kind of thing. And like the, as long as the plumber's consistently seeing a hundred homes per day, per, per uh, month, right. Then that means that 10 of them might get damaged. Right. So if you can think of something synergetically where now I'm not going just to BNI groups and networking, I do think that that's inconsistent, but if you can have a consistent, like, 300 accounts, meaning potential targets that refer us that I'm actively going on and they could actually use my service by referring me to somebody else. Like imagine if you're a pressure cleaner and a real estate agent could use you all the time at a closing and that real estate agent on average has five closings every single month, right? 
well, that's potentially five referrals that you can get. And then you work with a hundred real estate agents, for example, I think like that's the way to scale it versus, yeah, I agree that like the BNI groups and stuff can get a little hairy. So I think, I think probably the, the difference is the difference in the two would be one is very much a business to consumer conversation where it is hard to sell referrals and word of mouth. Whereas yep. business is that is actually how you would grow a b2b business truth exactly story. like the conceptually i mean not it's not always the case but conceptually like a, a business that is looking for a service um from another business is not always yep. looking through google or facebook to find it like if you're a you know if you're a mine if you're if you're a if you're a, a, a mine or you're a you know got a commercial agricultural business and you're looking at getting solar installed on your property chances are you, you that you're going to speak to someone, one of your mates that's had it, had that same service done there. You can see the savings. They've got that no like and trust with another store. It's referred to them and it's sort of through introduction, you know? And so exactly. it's slightly different, slightly different dynamic. Yep. Yeah. But, um, and then the other thing you can do is you can supercharge your efforts via online marketing. So you could start targeting potential referrers and acquire referrers because a customer lifetime value in a transactional business is just that one job. So like the bathroom remodeler, for example, if yeah. I acquire a customer and I spend whatever, I'm willing to spend a thousand dollars and I acquire a $20,000 bathroom remodel, that might be great, but I'm just getting that one remodel. But if I could target a interior designer and I can create lead magnets for interior designers and attract them to my business, right? Then, you know, I could talk to them and they have a high customer lifetime value because they're probably going to be able to refer more than just one. So I'm willing to spend to acquire the interior designer to have them refer me. Right. And that same thing works with a lot of different industries, including sure. in software. Right. We acquire referral partners, which are other people that service our same customer base. And then they come in and they plug us in basically. And, um, you know, we spend marketing dollars to acquire them because they have a much higher leverage than you know, going directly to the businesses. Yeah, it's one one to many as opposed one to one, which is yeah, definitely, exactly. It's definitely the advantage in yeah. the in the in the commercial space for sure. And yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe there's probably there's probably opportunities there for the residential, but I guess it does come down to like time. Where, like like you said earlier in the piece, like where's the best time? Where's time best spent in the in the early stages yeah. to get the machine moving? You know. Hundred percent. I think with yeah. the luxury that you get with volume and you get with consistency uh, and momentum, is you, you, like it helps you um, identify areas of opportunity that because because you have more time and you've got the money to invest in the resource into it, and you can kind of sit back and strategically sort of analyze these other areas. Where very often for us in the early stages, it's a case of let's just get the needle moving as quick as we can. You know? So. Yeah. yeah. And ads are the best way to do that. And online marketing in general, you know, put that baby on autopilot till you hit diminishing returns and then, you know, find that diminishing return point. But until you don't hit that, you know, keep spending there. I mean, I had a restoration business owner who generated $6.7 million of work off of $200,000 invested. And he was asking me, should I stop spending in marketing? I'm like, dude, your customer acquisition costs like 2%. Like, no, you <laughs> should keep going. Like I recommend 15 to 20%. Uh, within that space with high gross margin. But I'm like, yeah, you should keep spending, especially if the cost is low. Because it's what's right. the alternative? You're going to go and build all these relationships and waste all that time? No, just give Google the money and good, give the agency the money. So It's funny. I had this conversation with a, with a client um, last last week and I said, look, how can we how can we reduce reduce your, the spend with you? And I was like, well, hang on a second. Let's just, mm. let's just zoom out a little bit here. Like, what did you, what did you turn last year? He said, oh, about three and a half yep. million. Like, what did you spend on marketing? He's like, oh, hardly anything except for what I did with you guys. Mm -hmm. I'm like, right. So what do you want to turn next year? It's like, well, five mil. And I'm like, well, you, you can't expect to hit <laughs> five mil in turnover if you, without spending the money to get it. And I think this is the big disconnect. Like, you, know, you can't spend three grand a month in ads and expect to be doing a $5 million business, right? Like there's, and you, you said 15 to 20%. That's interesting. Like, you know, we, we, we typically say to guys, if you want to even be, it, it considering entering into a growth pattern, like you're spending 10% as a minimum really to, to be entering into that. And that, that will vary up and down. I mean, you, again, you don't know, you've got to use the data to drive those decisions. But I think when people, in, in my experience, when people come out of word of mouth and referrals, they've never had to consider marketing budget before. And so that, because they've, it's never become a part of their operational expenses, never been a discussion. But then when they move into this model, it's like, well, okay, you can have this outcome 
but you need to spend this money to get it. And we know it'll get you there, but you've got to be willing to do that, right? And and once I understand that, I think it's like, oh, okay, well, that's fine. Okay, yeah, sure. And then we'll just budget for that. We'll price it into our product services and stuff like that. But sometimes that's a hard sort of paradigm for people to um, digest in the early stages. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's a perfect segue into why I say that hustlers fail at scale. I mean, for the longest time ever, you're rewarded for building those relationships and for hustling your way through, and you're getting rewarded by the $3 million business that you've built. But you can't get from three to six without starting to understand, you know, hey, you know, this is going to fizzle out at some point. I can't just keep, you know, being the one that's attracting work forever. And a $20 million organization is completely different than a $3 million organization when it comes to customer acquisition, right? And you need to understand how to like, throw the investor hat on and start with the end in mind, say, okay, I got the three spending this much. If I want to get to six, I got to spend this much. And then like the budget, the marketing budget, like I'd freak out. Like, you know, you'd look at, you know, our company last month, it's like, Hey, you know, burn went down by X amount, you know, by 50 grand or whatever. I was like, man, I think that that went down because our salespeople didn't hit commission. And then I, I'm like, that's actually bad. Oh, we saved money. No, 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 no. We, we didn't grow, right? We didn't pay out commissions, which meant like, because those commissions are so fixated to where if they hit commission, it's a win-win for the company. It's mm. like, oh, they didn't, they didn't hit commission. They didn't hit quota. That's a problem. So when you get out of that hustle phase, right, to getting to your first couple million of dollars and you want to look to scale a company to over eight figures, you need to kind of like flip your role from like the hardworking person that's, you know, just moving around and super, super, super busy to like more of an analytical role where you can identify the areas where you truly invest and deploy capital within your business. And I think that's what a lot of people struggle with. I mean, people can't use data-driven decision-making. They use their gut a lot. Entrepreneurs, when they first start out, they're rewarded for using their gut. They're rewarded for being scrappy and starting, you know, literally from nothing and building something. But at the end of the day, if you look at businesses at scale, it's not the scrappiness that rewards them. You know, it's not the lowest paid employees that you see in really well, you know, driven organization. It's not the cheapest marketing budget. It's not the beat up trucks. It's not the scrappiness, right? It's something completely different. Mm -hmm. And that transition is something that's very hard for, for people to overcome, especially starting from nothing. Yeah, I, I guess it's it's just so foreign and unknown to them at that stage, which is not their fault either. Yeah. Like it's just the... I mean, when you go through trade school, <clears throat> excuse me, you, you, they don't teach you this stuff, right? And yep. and probably for a good reason, because most businesses don't ever get to the point where they have that conversation. You know, it's the ones that actually, so the ones that get to that point, they're like, okay, now we need to invest in ourselves and we need to learn these things. It's not necessarily their fault or anything they've done wrong. But the reality is if you're not green and growing, you're ripe and rotting. You've got to just got to keep evolving and learning things on how to get to where you need to go. And there are systems that can help you do it, but it does require change. And change, of course, is often met with resistance. <laughs> 100%. Cool. So what next? Well, I mean, we covered our, our main takeaways. What, uh, what do you think is the biggest problem that, uh, that your audience faces? Tell me more about that. Um, I think it's the, the biggest problem is their um, inability to reach their forecasted targets but the forecasted mm. targets are very often a wish or a what i'd like to have which can become a reality provided there's a strategy to back it and yeah. so i think that's kind of the thing where a lot of people go well i want to be a six million dollar business okay well tell me about that like what does that actually look mm. like what does fulfillment look like what does the office staff look like what is your what does your yep. marketing budget look like what do your marketing avenues look like what do your referral programs look yep. like you know, they don't really consider these things. And so, you know, the like, like a goal without a strategy is a wish, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's true, right? They've got to kind of, like, you, if, you, if you reverse engineer, and I've learned this over the years, truthfully, the hard way as well, but it's quite a, um, it's quite a satisfying experience. And it's, it's nice to know that if you can get a big picture goal and you can reverse engineer it and break that down so you take like a you know five-year goal of hitting six million and you break it down into you know a couple of years yearly monthly quarterly monthly and then weekly tasks daily tasks that kind of thing it's actually not that hard because exactly. when you break it down you're just like oh all we have to do is hit do two of these a month 
to be there in five years. It's actually yep. quite polarizing, but the reality is most yeah. people don't do it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of our um, restoration business owners catch themselves on what I call the reactive roller coaster, where um, to like even accelerate the problem of no, they're not setting these weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly goals. On top of that, they're focusing like rabbits on the wrong things. So like they'll focus, they'll have no work for this month. So then they'll focus and react to the fact that they had no work and then they'll try to get a bunch of work, but then they'll forget about production. Right. And then they'll realize, oh man, we have now a lot of work, but we didn't focus on production. So then they'll go and focus on production and fix all those things. And then they might forget about accounts receivable. Right. And then they'll realize, oh man, we did all this work. We produced it very well, but we have, you know, half a million dollars in accounts receivable. So then they'll shift their focus completely on that, forgetting about the other two right? And collect a bunch of money and then they'll see themselves flush, but then back to square one where they have no work. So yeah. they constantly have this, you know, up and down and up yeah. and down feeling. And it's like a vicious cycle. And then you're busy all the time. Like the hustle, again, you're feeling like you're super busy, your meetings back to back, you're meeting customers, you're doing all this, but the needle really isn't moving because you're like spinning your tires in the mud. Right. Yeah. And yeah. then the analogy that, that you talked about, I talk about people thinking of a flight, let's just say a flight from New York to LA, right? And what, what pilots do, right? They put together a flight plan from New York to LA and it's never a straight line. It's a series of these little points. And then every single minute, they scan their instruments to make sure they're on the flight plan. What most business owners do is the illusion of this. Picture a pilot launching it on the north heading, the airplane, and then going to sleep for two hours and waking up somewhere in Canada, right? <laughs> And then they're like, oh man, we needed to be down here. So then they'll turn the plane around, set it down south. I wish I could do an, an, uh, an Australian illusion of this, but we get the point. And then they go back to sleep for three hours, right? And then they end up down in Mexico and they're like, oh man. And then they turn it back around and then they end up, whatever, running out of gas or whatnot. That's what business owners do. They yeah. set a big, hairy, audacious goal, $6 million. They might even split it up, right? They might like say, okay, I'm going to get the six and then they fall asleep. I get stuck in the mud and then they come up for air and they check their numbers and they're like, oh, we're off track. So then they'll pull the whole business. They'll go in and drop the hand grenades. They'll yell at everybody, scream at, yell at everybody, right? Set it back on track. Then they'll go back to quote unquote sleep for another six months, i.e. getting stuck in the weeds. And um, yeah, the way to check it is basically every single week have a cadence of on track, off track, and mm -hmm. create those incremental changes where every single week you're like, hey, what did we win on? Where are we off track? And then make these small little tweaks every single week, every single month, every single quarter. And you're absolutely right. As long as you do that, I mean, you'll never hit 100% of plan. I promise you that's guaranteed. You're never going to, I've never seen a performer get hit 100%. But like I've been able to hit performers within 1% to 2% deviations, you know, quite often, like multiple years in a row. And hey, I'll it, take that, you know. Yeah. And I think as well, like in my experience, when you do strategize, when you set a game plan like this and you've got deliberate, actionable tasks that are lead metrics, like I'm not talking about the lag. Like this is, I think this is the big thing as well. Like people will always put the focus on the lag, right? I want to do 6 million. Okay, but what is actually 6 million in your business? Like how many sales mm -hmm. a month is that of this product or this service or whatever it might be? Yep. Like break it down to that because that's way more digestible than going, we need to do 200 grand this week. It's like, okay, but that doesn't fucking mean anything to me because I don't even know what I'm going to be yep. selling, right? So exactly. I think that's like one thing that people should really get clarity on. And then, But in my experience, when you you've, you do set those goals and you have a good a game plan with the, with, well, like you say, with the regular check-in cadence, weekly meetings, just to keep your finger on the pulse and make sure things are trending in the right direction, you, I've, never, I've never yet not hit a goal sooner than I expected. Like it always happens faster 100%. because – yeah, I mean, maybe that's because I'm not hitting, setting a big enough goal. I don't know, but I've just, I've just found it always. You always get there quicker, but when you don't have that plan, you never get there. I mean, the amount. Yeah, of and the key to too... this is what I want to do. Being this time next year, blah, blah blah, and all these hopes and dreams and bullshit you read in like these stupid books about things, and and then that's it. You write on the whiteboard, and I'm like going to manifest it. Like what a load of shit! Like get out there and do the work, but know what you're working towards. You know. Yeah, and you mentioned those like, hey, what does this mean? I call them assumptions. It's very important to like detail out your assumptions. So then if you're off track, you ask yourself why, and then you go back and link it to an assumption that you made. Because then it laser focuses. Like, hey, um, 
you know, I said that 200,000 this month meant 200 jobs at a thousand dollars a piece. Well, we did 200 jobs, but they were $500 a piece. So we got only a hundred thousand. Ah, now I can ask myself the question. Well, why is the average job size so low? Oh, well, because we were selling our pressure washing jobs, not our, you know, mold Mm -hmm. removal jobs or whatever it may be. Right. But like when you set the assumptions, you can then learn from your assumptions because in reality, business isn't as black and white as one moving part. Like, hey, revenue every single month. It's Mm -hmm. a hodgepodge of, you know, different employees, revenue per production employee, the different products you sell, the blend of margins. Like there's just so many moving parts. And as long as you can make assumptions for each of these categories and how they progress over a month. And then when you fall short, you can see which category you fell short in. And then you could adjust. It's like. It's super powerful. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because I think as well, like when, when businesses come to work with us, they'll often, like they'll have, they'll have a go, like because we were saying onboarding, you know, what is it that you wanted, you know, you're wanting to hit on monthly targets and this kind of stuff. And they'll say they come back with a number like, we want to be doing, you know, 100 grand or 150 grand a month, right? And we go, okay, cool. What are you doing now? We're doing this much. I'm like, right. So what's your product? What, what What's your product, average product ticket size, right? And that alone like if you can just imp- increase the product ticket size, like we work with a lot with solar companies, right? And they're out there selling solar panels. And I'm like, sell an energy package. Like we can take your yeah, average yeah. ticket item from 12 grand to 30 with a click of a finger. And you won't sell as many okay. of them, but you don't need to. <laughs> you don't, you and that's the key. If you can increase the ticket size and get to your goals, which is larger tickets, who wouldn't want fewer customers, fewer but, projects oh, and more yeah, dollar amount? Okay. It's a no brainer. makes more money. Yeah. yeah. So- I mean, but I think, and sometimes when people see that in paper, or they, 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 it's communicated to them where they're like, "Oh, that makes sense. What have I been doing?" You know, it's a bit, a bit of a polarizing perspective on different way of doing something. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, this was really cool. I loved uh, riffing yeah. about this so far. Yeah, no, it's been good. Like, it's it's good, it's good it's good to hear that we have similar uh, experiences and, um, you know conversations that happen in cross markets yeah especially two different corners of the world right like you know but that's the thing i've I've noticed common trends like my client in australia i love him but and he's built a great business off of off of hustle and such but doesn't know his numbers doesn't know his fundamentals right it's like ah, i have jay the cfo or so and so you know that handles all that and he views it as just like a function of the tax man right It's like, no, like really diving in and understanding those numbers, you get to know what levers you're going to pull on within your business. If you don't understand those things, when you get to mass, when you get to the scale, you don't know what to pull on, you know? And uh, most people, they, they kind of shy away from it and they kind of hide under the excuse of, oh, I don't need, I'm not the techie accountant kind of nerd kind of person, but I'm not either. I'm totally the entrepreneur. I'm totally you know, the people person wanting to sell ice to Eskimos or whatever, but I still have to know my numbers mm-hmm. because like you have to be able to put together and articulate a plan um, and know where am I spending the money, you know? And sometimes in business, we're trading a dollar for a dollar. Sometimes we're trading a dollar for 50 cents back. Mm-hmm. And other times we're trading a dollar for $20. And like our blend across the whole business looks like, I don't know, a dollar for $5 and it's great. But what if I told you that you can find the areas where you're trading a dollar for 50 cents and replace those for a dollar for $20, right? But most business owners don't, don't necessarily do that. And it's, it's simple math. You just have to be curious and kind of, you know, hustlers do everything by the gut and by the gut feeling and by the sentiment of the rewards. At scale, if you look at like the true owner operators, the investors, they do, they implement something called data-driven decision-making. So like, I work with data and if I don't know how to do the data, I go hire a data person, right? And I try to ask the questions of what's my average ticket size, right? And then try to work my way through the data to be able to come up with my conclusion versus, ah, you know, we should get into cleaning solar panels because I saw Bobby did it and he's making a boatload of money and I think we should do it too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. No, that, yeah that's, that's a whole nother issue. Like trying to, trying to do something because someone else is doing it well. <laughs> that really always comes yeah. unstuck. It, it reminds me of this. I've told this story before on the podcast, but like many, many, many years ago, we worked with a company out in uh, Western Australia and they were a, they were a plumbing company um, who have 
long since sold that business. But um, at the time when we were working with them, they had a they were, they were, de- they were a pretty big business. Like they were a decent size. Um, they had you know twenty odd staff. Uh, they had a commercial division and they had a residential residential division. And the commercial division was essentially what was keeping the business afloat. Like it was all their cash flow. It was really, um, uh, it was really what was paying all the team members. But it was pretty much only paying the team members. And mm. what, like when we had this meeting with the the, the guy, and I'm I'm not a coach by the way, so this is just like this was just the advantage of having someone with a different perspective look in through the outside into something that I could see. You know, after asking a few questions, was clearly fractured. And I said, you know, what, what are the what are the goals here of this business? They're like, we really want to grow residential, but it's really hard because we can't find staff and we can't do this and that. Like, if you had the staff, would you be able to grow it? And they go, absolutely. I'm like, well, you've got 15 of them over here, and you're telling me that mm. at the moment, although it's a it's accountable to your revenue, your profit, it's it's like a fraction of your profit. It was like five or ten percent, like in the profits, like it was pathetic. Whereas in the residential, it was significant. Like they were, like their money was so good over there. They really, they really wanted to grow because they knew that. So we just like sat down with them, and I just drew out a few things, and I was like, if you started pulling resource out of here, and you took some of those guys from the uh, commercial division, and you put them into residential, and some of them might want to do it, so some of them will leave, but some of them will stay. Like that will help you get to where you need to go. And they did it over the course of 12 months. They did it. They scaled back. Their accountants lost their fucking shit. You can imagine, right? Because all of a sudden their their revenue halved pretty much or more. I think it was even more than halved in the first year. Like everyone was freaking out. But I'm like, just trust the numbers. Like it's, don't worry yep. about the revenue. Worry about, don't worry about what you, the turnover. Worry about what's left over. You know, their profits yep. were going through the roof. And so they were just, they knew they were on the right track. And then eventually they ended up shutting down that commercial division. Um, they, and they were full residential and then they sold it. Um, and they were yeah. stoked. <laughs> yeah. So, no, it's, it's, it's definitely it's a reality. And tested what you're saying. Like, I think mean, you just got to, like, if you know your numbers within the, I mean, we, we do it now. Like, every single, like, I run PLs on every product within the business yep. now. Cause I'm like, I want to know, I know some of these are not, so we either pick this up or I've shut it down, you know? So yep. yeah, I encourage our guys to do it too. I'm like, what we're doing with you, run a P and L on it. Like for, I mean, zoom out a bit. Cause you need 12 months of this to actually, you know, give, get accurate numbers, but like run a P and L on it. And if it's not working, then shut it down. Simple. Yep. If it's working. And literally if you take, if you take your 12 month, month by month P and L and drop it into a spreadsheet and then go to the right 12 more months and put in, your magic future numbers that's called forecasting right and then you ask yourself every single month how far off was i on every single little column right exactly. um so yeah it's it's super important um super super important and a lot of entrepreneurs just shy away from it so Well, mate, look, this has been a great conversation. I feel like we could talk forever on this, but I'm, I'm respectful of the time over there. It's probably getting late and you've probably got family to get it back to. So um, we should probably get to tying this up. But I will say for any of you listeners and viewers out there, if you have any questions or um, you know any anything we haven't covered off on here, let us know. I'm, I'm sure Alex will be willing to jump back on the show and answer a few of these questions. And I'll absolutely put some links to the book um, in, and there's a lead magnet for your playbook. I'm guessing the Restoration Sales Plays book is not the – uh, it's not the book, right? No, that's not the book. We can okay. um, we can just drop in the book and then my socials if they want to follow me on online on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, all it. that. It's Alex Duda. All that. Yeah, so, it's Alex yeah. Duda. It's great. I've got all that right here. So if you guys want to get a hold of Alex, cool. you can have show notes. And if you're in the um, if you're in that restoration vertical and you're looking for software, definitely check out um, Albi Soft Albiware. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much, Alex, Matt. This was awesome. Time, loved, yeah, yeah, I loved riffing with you, man. Absolutely, buddy. We'll or, um, mate, <laughs> mate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, good on you. Uh, look forward to chatting in the future, and keep up the good work over there. Thanks, man. Likewise. Ciao.
New Zealand-based home renovation company, 6,593% ROAS. Sydney-based solar company, 2,700% ROAS. Hunter region-based bathroom renovation company, 5,616% ROAS. Melbourne-based building company, 13,182% return on ad spend. Adelaide-based solar company, 2,881% return on ad spend. Guys, the list goes on and on. If you're a trade-based business and you work with projects like roofing, solar, bathroom renovations, kitchen renovations, anything like that, head across to tradey.wiki forward slash pod for podcast. tradey.wiki forward slash pod for podcast. Book in a conversation. It is game changing.